Hi, all you nurses out there. Thanks for tuning in to PACU Nursing Minutes today. We're going to talk about something that's really elementary. We do it without even thinking. And I just want to spend some time talking about it because it is so important if we forget to do this. And what I am talking about is preventing DVTs or venous thromboembolisms, um, also known as blood clots. So I've had the pleasure of nursing for many years and I unfortunately have to say I've seen every type of embolus that can occur. Um, when I was in the ICU, we had um, a woman post arrest from uh, giving birth with an amniotic embolism. Um, I've seen many, many thrombus embolisms um, from a clot that was formed in the lower extremities and then went to the lungs and developed a PE. Um, I have seen air embolisms after central line removals, and, um, and I've seen fat embolisms from orthopedic surgeries and massive trauma. So um, it is a real problem out there, and I just wanted to spend some time talking about it because we have learned so much through basic mechanical prevention and early ambulation that it really does help to minimize the development of a clot and a potential PE or stroke or MI, depending on where that clot mobilizes to. So let's get right down to the very basics, and oh, if you feel like I'm giving you value added, please subscribe down below and share with your colleagues. And also, if you want to learn more about educational opportunities, go to PACUNursingMinutes.com. There you can sign up for a CPAN review course that's coming this fall. You can also sign up for my newsletter, which I hope to get out quarterly. And then you can also sign up for a free downloadable report sheet for a safe handoff. So again, if you feel like I'm giving you value added, please like, subscribe, and share with all of your colleagues. Now let's get back to venous thromboembolism prevention. So um, as I said, I've been nursing for a while now, and I can say that, yeah, um, I remember the days before we had sequential um, compression devices, SCDs, and um, people stayed in bed for like, four, three, four, five days after a hip replacement or after uh, um, a total joint replacement or a massive trauma. I mean, now we ambulate and get everybody up immediately. And that has been shown tremendously to minimize venous thromboembolisms is early ambulation. So a blood clot, before we knew all that we know about prevention, the incidence of venous thromboembolus was anywhere from 40 to 80 percent in your total joint replacement patient population. So we're talking about the total hip replacements, the total knee replacements. So that is a significant number. I mean that is profound and no wonder PEs are so common. I mean I remember PEs used to be very common. Um, now they are less common due to our prevention measures, which I will talk about, but it still happens and we still need to be aware of what are the mechanics behind it. So if you all remember Virchow's triad, we're gonna review that. So there's three main things that happen that can cause the right storm for a clot to develop. And first off is venous stasis. Pretty much your patient's laying in bed. They are immobile. That is venous stasis. When you sit in at your chair for an extended period of time, that's venous stasis. You know, when people go on long airplane flights, that's venous stasis. That's why we promote um, ankle pumps and leg exercises because those deep muscles in your legs, they massage the, your vasculature, your veins, and those valves, and it helps facilitate the blood return back to the heart. But when our patients are hospitalized, they are in bed, they are immobile, and that, that allows for the very first part of that Virchow's triad, that cascade of venous stasis. Now, the second part of the triad is damage to the vessel wall. And the reason why our post-joint 
replacement patient population, your total knees, your total hips, um, and then your fractures, your pelvic fractures, your long bone fractures. Um, they, all of them have an interruption of their vasculature due to either trauma or elective surgery. So that surgery, that dislocation of that joint so that they can get that artificial joint in, that causes a damage to that vessel wall. Um, whether it's inadvertently through an accident or whether it's intentionally due an elective surgery, there is a level of damage. And that is why the incidence is so high if we don't do things to prevent venous thromboembolisms. So with surgery, they have a change in the vessel wall integrity, okay? Then the next thing is change in the clotting cascade. So when our patients either have a trauma from a, um, an accidental fracture, or if they're having elective joint replacement surgery, they do have a change in their clotting cascade. Um, patients before TXA, they would lose like a liter of blood with their hip replacement or their knee replacement. Now that we have TXA, we've been able to really minimize the amount of volume loss. But anyone who has any kind of change um, in their um, bleeding uh, cascade, um, whether it's from massive blood loss or from the surgery or from the trauma is going to be at prone to developing a venous thromboembolism. So you can see how having an elective um, joint replacement automatically sets up the perfect cascade with the Virchow's triad. I mean, we trigger everything with it. And that is why the incidence um, has been so high without prevention. Now, risk factors. Um, Total hip replacements, total knee replacements, total joint replacement surgeries are at risk. And then our long bone fractures, uh, femur fractures, pelvic fractures, and then surgery that is extended and prolonged. Um, and also abdominal surgery has been associated with risk of venous thromboembolism. Other factors are the elderly are at higher risk. Obesity has a higher risk. That might also play into some leaky valve disease, um, congestive heart failure, if they've had an MI, if they've had a stroke, um, and then malignancy also adds to your risk factor. And don't forget good old estrogen and birth control pills replacement uh, estrogen therapy. That does increase your risk for a venous thromboembolism and smokers. <laughs> so let me just run down that quickly. If you're elderly over 75 years old, obese, have had a stroke or an MI, um, if you're a smoker, if you have uh, congestive heart failure, and uh, if you've had a DVT in the past, and if you're on estrogen replacement therapy like birth control pills. So what do we do uh, in the perioperative world to minimize these blood clot, the chance of a blood clot from forming? And um, what we do is so important. You may think it's really elementary, but it's not. It is crucial. I mean, for some of these patients, if we don't do this, it could end up in a um, significant increase in mortality if they do develop a venous thromboembolism. So those TED hose stockings uh, in pre-op are so important to do. Uh, I can't stress that enough. And don't throw away the other stocking after you've put it on your patient. Let's say they're gonna have a knee replacement. You measure them up and you size them up and you get the right size TED hose. You put it on the non-operative leg with the SCD um, compression uh, sleeve. Lay the other one in the bed. Um, because that needs to get on that leg post-operatively, um, the operative leg. I know you're not going to put it on pre-operatively because that leg is going to be operated on and put under a sterile drape and everything. And so it would be just futile to put it on before surgery, but it needs to go into the bed with the patient to the OR because either the OR team will put it on after surgery, after the, the dressing has been placed on, they can slip on the compression stockings and then they can put on the cold therapy and then they can put on the SCD machine on top of that and then they can actually even wrap the compression dressing, the ACE wrap, all around that. And then that way we are guaranteeing venous thromboembolism prevention in that post-knee patient population. 
Again, with your total hips, um, you want to be placing it on um, the, the non-operative leg and then also you can place below the knee on the operative leg and have that on. If the OR doesn't like that, they can take it off. Um, but we want to initiate prevention in the pre-op phase so that we give them the best bet of preventing a blood clot while they are going through their elective surgery. So remember, it starts preoperatively in pre-op with TEDs and uh, sequential compression devices uh, for our total joint replacement replacement patient population, and then also for um, our general surgery patient population, like that abdominal surgery, or for our trauma patients, um, you'll put it on if you can. Uh, remembering if the leg is involved and there's a tibial fracture, obviously you're not gonna put it on, but do put it in the bed. Um, so that later on down the road, if there is an opportunity to put it on, we can put it on. Don't throw that second one away. And I will tell you that studies have shown that placing the TED hose and the SCD on the non-operative leg has decreased venous thromboembolisms in the non-operative leg as much as by 20%. So it really is important to be placing it on that non-operative leg. Now, um, other things that we do in addition to mechanical prophylaxis, which is the TED hose and the sequential compression device, the SCDs, is we teach our patients isometric exercises. Remember, um, they're gonna be doing their foot pumps exercises while they are in bed to help facilitate blood return to the heart uh, and keep tone in the vasculature of the lower extremities, preventing the venous stasis. Um, and then that always goes with early ambulation. With our outpatient population who are going under arthroscopy surgeries for like, let's say a meniscectomy or um, a, um, an ACL repair, early ambulation has been shown to be preventative in venous thromboembolism. And it's the number one prevention that we do in our um, arthroscopy patient population. Um, now in phase two, we always want to make sure that they are getting adequate hydration because dehydration can alter that clotting cascade and make um, a ripe storm for uh, coagulopathy and clot formation. Um, and then for pharmacological prophylaxis, um, prophylaxis may be ordered pre-op and usually the goal around that is to have it given 12 hours before surgery. Definitely don't want anything given four to six hours before surgery. And then if the surgeon opts to start um, pharmacological prophylaxis after surgery, the standard is to start it usually 12 hours after surgery. Again, avoiding the four to six hour window um, within around the surgery ending. So usually if they start low molecular weight heparin, that will, the dose postoperatively is usually initiated sometime around that 12 to 24 hour mark. And this is surgeon specific and dependent, and they may choose to different, use a different pharmacological agent depending on the patient's uh, clinical presentation and their liver and kidney function uh, and then other comorbidities going on with them. So now that we've talked about all the things to prevent a venous thromboembolism, now we need to talk about what are the signs if somebody does develop a venous thromboembolism. So first thing that they're usually going to do is have some calf pain and tenderness. Uh, the site may be warm to touch, edema and swelling um, in that area. And then if you flex their foot up, they may have pain in their calf and that is called a positive Hohmann sign. Now a positive Hohmann sign is not absolute and definitive. Usually the diagnostic study to examine that is a Doppler of the lower extremities. So, and then you always want to be watching out for a PE. Um, and the classic sign of that is someone who goes into immediate respiratory distress and it can be life-threatening. So again, prevention, prevention, prevention. And when we talk about the SCD machine, so the sleeves get put on in pre-op. It follows them to the OR. The OR 
connects them immediately as they get them onto the OR table. So they're pumping all during the surgery. And then when they come to pack you, they need to be connected and continue to pump while they are on their bed rest or while they're non-ambulatory. The TED stockings and the SCDs should stay on until the patient is ambulatory, okay? because what we are treating is the venous stasis. That is the preventative measure here, the, the mechanism, the, the mechanical prophylaxis of the sequential compression devices. So if you're in PACU and somebody starts pulling off your patient's SCD sleeves and putting them in the recycle bin, uh, 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 say no, they stay on until the patient is ambulatory. So they can remove them in phase two when they're ready for discharge, or they can remove them up on the floor when the patient is working with PT and getting back to being ambulatory. So I just wanna remind you that because I've seen that out there in practice and I've had to say things. And I just wanna emphasize, it's such a basic elementary thing that has such a profound impact for the outcome for these patients. And we wanna give our patients the best outcome. So remember, Put those TED stocking hoses on. And I usually post-op will put them on um, while that spinal is still on board so that they are not in a lot of discomfort as I'm wiggling that all the way up their leg, okay? And um, some places differ on if they put them on in the OR or if it gets put on in the PACU. But if your patient comes to PACU and they don't have their TED and their SCDs on that operative leg, get it on. And the kindest way is to do it before the spinal wears off um, or while they're still really groggy from a general. It's a great opportunity for you to do your neurovascular checks at that time and your sensory checks and your motor checks as well. So um, I hope this sheds some light on some basic things that we do to prevent a serious complication that has had in the past significant uh, consequences for our total joint replacement, replacement population, venous thromboembolism prevention. And so remember, TEDs and SCDs, get them on, keep them on, until they're ambulating. All right. Thanks everyone for tuning into PACU Nursing Minutes. I'm Nurse Kathy. I hope you enjoy the rest of this summer. And uh, if any of you are in the armed forces or have family members in the armed forces, just know that uh, your loved ones are in my prayers daily. God bless America. Thank you.